and um, I'm worried that the construction noise around here is going to resume, and then at that point, I'm going to have to mute completely. So, shall we check it out here? Yeah, I've made you the presenter. Okay. So, can people see uh, a pair of radiographs here? Yes. Can I get this out of the way? Um, okay, so this is a um, chemotherapy patient with relapsed AML. She's not had a second transplant at this point. And we have an earlier radiograph here on your right, which is the um, August the 3rd. And then she developed this diffuse fine nodular lung disease that you can see in the second radiograph on your left here on the um, 11th. And this is what CT looked like the next day. It turns out there is a ton of very small nodules, and some of them are immediately subpleural, and some of them are along the fissures here, so that this would be a miliary pattern implying bloodborne dissemination of some infection here. At the same time, she had skin lesions, and a skin, the skin lesions were biopsy. Let me show you what the MIFs look like here, because it does help to bring this this pattern out here of these very small nodules. So miliary pattern, presumably infection. She had skin lesions, skin lesions were biopsied and they recovered a yeast-like organism, which they said was either histoplasmosis, which we don't have much of here, or candida glabrata. Those were their two uh, candidates. And this fits with other cases I've seen of disseminated small nodules in the setting of candida glabrata. So that's my um, that's my vote that this is candida here, but it's either candida or maybe histoplasmosis here. And there hasn't been any um, there hasn't been any uh, PCR distinction of those two, and all of, all the uh, cultures at this point are in. She was put on antifungals and she got better, but so one consideration for small nodules. This is the second case I've seen is candida glabrata. Okay. And let me show you this uh, second case. This is also a chemotherapy patient who developed this big uh, lung consolidation here that is um, mid-August. And then we have a follow-up radiograph a few days later, um, which also shows, see, this is the, this is a few days later, this is the 24th now. We still have this consolidation. There may be, we may be seeing a lucency within it. There's another big patch of consolidation in the right apex. And th this um, neutropenic patient has this cavitary lung lesion here in the apex, a few of them, consolidation with cavitation, this big lesion here medially, and then a big lower lobe lesion too, also with cavitation. Um, not much in the way of pleural effusion accompanying this thing, but it looks like a pretty bad sort of infection. And this turns out to be our friend Legionella mcdadii, again. So it's a cause of lung nodules uh, with cavitation. Your first guess often is that it's a fungal infection. I thought this was gonna be mucor because it came up fairly quickly, but it came up so quickly um, that it actually fits better for Legionella. So Mc Legionella mcdadii is one of those fungus-like presentations, but often it moves much faster than fungus, even mucor moves. It can change overnight in a very dramatic way. So another case of Legionella mcdadii. Mm. Okay, so those cases I wanted to show you guys, and we made it with this break in construction here. There are no jackhammers going <laughs> off near my head. What a relief. Well, if it makes you feel better, David, I've had construction over my head for the last five years. <laughs> so <laughs> really? okay. I've just sort of tuned it out. Okay, those Got are it. great. Well, I'll, when I come, when I, when I share my cases, I just found, I remember to have a companion case for yours. I'll, I'll remember to show. All right, okay. um, let's see, who do we got on the line? We got Howard and Peter and... Uh, I'm here. All right, well, which one of you wants to go? I can go. That's... All right. Uh, let me move this over. never know which screen it is. Screen three. Uh, all right. So the 
this is just a nice example of, I don't know, we, we'll, we'll look at it and it's a pretty example, but it's a pretty example of a lot of stuff that happens, I think, on the outside that can lead to badness. So, uh, you know, here's this patient that comes in with, she's an older patient and we can see this very fluffy anterior mediastinal soft tissue. It's interspersed with fat. It breaks apart. Um, let me show it, find the axial. I don't know which one's the axial. Uh, you also know it's an outside study when all you get is five millimeter thick slices. Um, I don't know how people make diagnoses on slices this thick, but you can see this is, you know, clearly some sort of hyperplastic thymic tissue. Thymic tissue. There's no abnormal uh, mass here. It's just, just thymus. And then of course it gets red as something. And oh, sorry, you're better. I didn't even see that. Sorry. Um, which case is this? Oh, I'll, I'll take a poll. What do you guys think this is? Patient comes in, has this. Um, badness. Uh, yeah, badness. Some sort and of coma or something. What? A sarcoma of some sort, yeah. like a synovial <laughs> cell. Yeah, I thought it was some sort of sarcoma. You know, if the patient was a smoker, not, but she was in small cells, some sort of nasty sarcoma. And then here I go and look back at the old outside study from, um, oop, these are out of order. Let me make sure I get these in order. The old outside study, which tells us all, um, which one, here it is. So this is 2015, the patient had this, was biopsied um, and she disappeared. She didn't want anything done with it. This was a type B thymoma. Uh, weird location, a little bit outside the anterior mediastinal, but still kind of anterior mediastinal. Um, and I, I still didn't believe it seeing the CT because I've never seen a um, thymoma kind of do that. And I have also MRs and PETs and all this stuff showing the complete nasty of this, nastiness of this thing. I'm just curious if anyone else has seen a thymoma look like this without, you know, no pleural seating. Um, and I still didn't believe it. But anyways, they did an extra pleural pneumonectomy on this patient. They, they shrunk it with radiation and chemo and they did a pneumonectomy and they took it out and it was all just, a, it was a type B thymoma. And I, I've seen a lot of thymomas. I've just never seen one that looked like this without clear, you know, plural involvement. Anyways, just a interesting appearance of a thymoma. Um, another interesting case, which uh, is unfortunate. Oh, no, that's not it. Uh, I'll just show this for comparison. This is not a thymoma, but this was, unfortunately, I don't have the preoperative studies, but this was a young kid who was in Mexico and had a cough and had a CT, had a posterior mediastinal mass that I'm guessing looked like this, and they called it a teratoma. Um, it was not as big as this, but it was big. It was like 15 centimeters, kind of real rounded. Um, I think most of us know that teratomas usually don't look like this. Yeah, there's fat in it, but um, you know, this, this was a liposarcoma. So this was a posterior mediastinal liposarcoma that was um, resected. And unfortunately, soon after they resected it, he developed tumor, which I'm guessing, uh, I still not 100% sure what space that is. Um, it looks like it's plural space to me. But uh, here was the resection bed. And somehow, either during surgery or something, they spilled something in the pleura. And then over the course of like three months, literally three months, that thing went from just that little bit in the pleura to all of this. Um, and this is just a really bad mixoid liposarcoma. Uh, liposarcoma, yeah. So again, liposarcomas are not that super rare in the mediastinum. Um, and then lastly, this is more of, have you kind of like, have you guys ever seen this before? Uh, this is A22, a woman who has some immunodeficiency. Okay, looks like standard, okay, bronchiectasis. Typical immunodeficiency looking, so had previous pneumonias, okay. This is um, three weeks later. And look what's happened to the, and I'll pull it back. So look what's happened to those airways that were 
severely bronchiectatic. Um, there was some assuming superimposed airway infection, and they like contracted, dramatically contracted. And then this is now six days later. They treated her with whatever, and the airways pop back open. Have you guys ever seen that before? Uh, no. Do, do you think they could have just um, collapsed down from underinflation? I didn't look at the differences in, in lung volume, but. No, so they're not really that, um, you know, she's breathing a little bit, but it's really not. In ex this is more of an expiratory phase here. You can see the trachea is bowed on this older study, but it's not significantly, yeah, she's breathing a little bit, but it's not like the significant hyperinflation. Um, I just had never seen air. So we, we try to get the floor team to bring her back and do a dynamic. We were wondering if this could be somewhat dynamic or if it's just related to the infection. Uh, we try to get them to bring her back down and just let us do a dynamic kind of expiratory study. Um, but they, they had no interest in it because they're like, she's doing fine. I, I just had never seen the airways kind of contract down like this with, with inflammation and then pop right back open a few days later when the inflammation improves. Oh. I don't know if there's anything else to say beyond, I mean, look at these, like these huge bronchiectatic airways and they're just these little guys. Okay. That's interesting. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how, but uh, we were we were stumped by it as well. But uh, that's it. That's it. All right. Thanks, Seth. Thank you. Who else has some cases? I have uh, three that are short. The first one I'm going to show um, in reverse order because it's interesting. So imagine if you were looking at a CT without any history and noticed small <coughs> well circumscribed, small, thin walled or even almost an imperceptible wall to cystic spaces like that. There's one right there, for example. So there are several of these in the lungs and they are just what they look like. And without any history, you would come up with a differential diagnosis for thin wall cystic spaces, which Particularly if it's an incidental finding, you might wonder about the cystic spaces one might see with Sjogren syndrome, for example. But we know what the differential diagnosis for thin wall cystic spaces is. And now I'll show you that these cystic spaces used to be a little bit earlier this, no, sorry, last year, solid nodules. And there are lots of them, but I will show you that many of these correspond to solid nodules previously. So this patient has a history of a metastatic adenocarcinoma involving lung, which was located in the middle lobe, was treated for that. And I wish I knew exactly which drug or drugs, but presumably, either an EGFR inhibitor or checkpoint inhibitor, one of those drugs. And I don't know why, but these basically cavitated but left really well-defined cystic spaces. So that's interesting. I think I've seen it once or twice before, but usually I think with sarcomas. But what's a bit unusual about these is how thin-walled or even non-walled these little spaces are that have remained behind as a response to treatment. There is still some atelectasis of the middle lobe. So just a curiosity for that. Here is one that's interesting 
definitely an incidental discovery of a lesion. Now here, what's interesting about this, two things, one is this one is very circumscribed. So there's a rather sharp interface between the abnormal lung and uh, normal lung in the right upper lobe. The cystic space is kind of reminiscent of what one might see with bronchial atresia, but what's really interesting, and I'll bring up the sagittal, is that unlike a usual bronchial atresia where we see the mucus filled bronchus, this one is calcified. So there's the tubular structure, which seemingly a tubular structure that's calcified in the middle of that circumscribed cystic space. So I know we'll never actually get pathology on this, but I don't recall seeing a bronchial atresia with calcification, if this is what it is, and a very spherical lesion like that. So Howard, I think this is a hybrid lesion. I think that's a CPAM with bronchial atresia. If you look okay. at, I showed a case of, a few years ago of a trauma patient that had multiple lesions like this. And okay. if you look in the, the lucent area, you can see sort of dysplastic, I don't know what's the right word, but abnormal lung with some lucencies and just some thin sort of ratty vessels yes. running through it. Yes. But I think that's why it's a space occupying lesion is because okay. it's a CPAM and it's not uncommon to see bronchial atresia in a CPAM, but I've never seen calcification as the, the mucosil. So that's really cool. Yeah, I think we know we've all seen mucosils before and sometimes we see uh, salts deposited in the in the mucus uh, like with ABPA but this one's very calcified right interesting but I can't think of a better explanation for for this thing so that's interesting too this last one is just a demonstration of displacement spontaneous displacement as best I can tell of the coronary vein lead of a CRTD device. Now, first off, what's unusual about the leads here is that this lead is usually in the atrial appendage and curves. So this lead is unusual too in this context. But in comparing these, you can see on this radiograph that this lead, which is the coronary vein lead, has migrated out. Now, this patient already has an LVAD, so it probably doesn't matter, but if the patient has a CRTD and the coronary vein lead starts to come out from its intended location, it may result in insufficient resynchronization of ventricular contraction. Um, so I think I've seen this once before in the context of cardiac surgery where the lead started coming out. And I presume this is one that is um, coming out. It is one that's coming out as well. So here it is compared to there. Howard, what, what's the interval between these exams? Couple months. So let's see, a couple of months up between. Now the heart is smaller, but the patient's got an LVAD in. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to. You know, let me see. Yeah, I don't know why this is, why this happened, why this came out. Right. And by virtue so, of the fact that the patient's got an LVAD in already, uh, doesn't mean that this this finding is significant because the patient already needs this extra corporeal left ventricular assistance support. So, uh, you know, I saw the same thing about two weeks ago. We had the the cardiac vein lead back out like this and they um you know that's not the lead that I look at that carefully but you know the other leads were intact they recognized that they had a um, conduction problem and so the thing had migrated and there was no surgery that had triggered it so it seems to be something that can just happen spontaneously yeah yeah it does um, I don't know why this lead was left in that position because that's not a proper place for an atrial lead either, but that was left in that place too. Perhaps because the fact of this device isn't clinically important anymore in terms of therapy. 
it doesn't matter if it's not working well, I think, at least in terms of ventricular synchronization, at least. Patients got an LVAD. So just a, a little curiosity as well. Okay, Jeff, those are mine. All right. Uh, Peter, do you have any cases this week? Yeah, I got a few, Jeff. All right. The presenter. Okay. Well, let's get started with um, this cardiac case. So, so this patient is getting uh, got a cardiac MRI for. Uh, uh, she had elevated troponins and uh, decreasing EF. She came in with heart failure, basically low EF. Uh, she has a history of scleroderma, and uh, this is kind of a viability examination. So. Um, this is the four chamber uh, uh, steady state free procession image. And um, uh, just looking at the left ventricle, you can see decreased uh, systolic function. Uh, the RV systolic function is down. There's also some degree of uh, diastolic dysfunction here. Atria are slightly enlarged. Um, there is a good sized pericardial effusion, uh, which is one of the manifestations of scleroderma, uh, cardiac involvement. And um, the other images I'm gonna show are just the delayed enhancement. So um, this is the four chamber uh, delayed enhancement. You can see um, some of the cardial enhancement here, but uh, the rest of the myocardium is viable. So you just have sub, sub in the cardial enhancement. And um, these are the short axis so you can see this uh, almost circumferential subendocardial. There's some some uh, enhancement here at the RV as well as we go further. So the, the interesting thing here is that um, this is subendocardial, but it's not a uh, coronary distribution subendocardial. So this is one of the um, one of the findings you can see with uh, heart cardiac disease and uh, scleroderma, as you can see uh, it manifests as this sub diffuse subendocardial. Uh, fibrosis in the, uh, it seems like from what I've read, the prevailing theory is that this is all uh, microvascular uh, obstruction from the systemic uh, sclerosis. It causes uh, fibrosis of the arterial, so you, you get this subendocardial uh, fibrosis. Uh, the patient also had, um, uh, by T1 mapping, they had elevated uh, T1. Uh, values of their myocardium, which is consistent with uh, interstitial fibrosis uh, of the myocardium. She also has uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, which you would expect with with scleroderma, and you can see um, elevated, uh, not elevated, but uh, enhancing uh, insertion points here. Um, but the whole or the whole RV wall is enhancing the whole free the wall. wall. Yeah. Oh. There's a lot of enhancement of the RV wall as well. I mean, and to, yeah, I guess a free wall. I mean, that's it's gone. I mean, it's all enhancing. Yeah. That's right there. I mean, I've never. How often have you seen that stuff? Um, I've never seen that with scleroderma. Um, I, and you know that insertion point enhancement. That's really. I mean, that's yeah. Thick and they super yeah. intense. I mean, I've never seen this with scleroderma. That's that's well, well, pulmonary yeah. hypertension. We see that we see that all the time. No, no, but but that, but that, no, I mean, that's uh, yeah. yeah, but that is really intense nodular, and, yeah. and 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 the free wall you don't see that with pulmonary hypertension. Um, yeah, how often have you seen this subendocardial? Never, never with scleroderma. I, I mean, I, 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 it's interesting you report that. I'll have to look it up. I, I've never well, seen that. It's really well, interesting. And then. Uh, the the cat the 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 cat was was normal. Um, yeah. Oh, it's definitely not a vascular thing. I mean, it's yeah. not like a, a coronary thing. It's really yeah. interesting, and yeah. it's not a myocarditis thing. I I just never seen that. Um, but, but, so that made sense to me though that um, you could get basically sclerosis, uh, fibro. I mean, basically fibrosis of your microvasculature. Yeah. That I mean, kind of explain why you would have all this subendocardial. If this is, this I mean, we know that there's microvascular disease and pulmonary. You know, on the pulmonary side. Yeah. These people get microvascular disease in the pulmonary arterioles, leading to the pulmonary hypertension. So, I, I don't see why it couldn't involve the heart. I just never seen it, never heard of it. That's interesting. Oh. Okay. 
this one I I like because I don't see too many of these. And I don't have a collection of them really, but uh, I'll just show the images and I'll give the diagnosis. So this is a patient with a um, just basically diffuse lung disease, and it's a uh, it's a congenital abnormality. Um, but um, this is a, uh, a lab-proven uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen too many of them that are, have been proven. I haven't shown too many of these cases. But uh, if, you look, if you look at some of these lobules, um, it's kind of a good example. I see the, the whole lobule is uh, completely destroyed here. And uh, you can barely see a pulmonary artery in the middle. It's very effaced. Um, pulmonary veins are a little bit more prominent uh, on the periphery in, in the, of the secondary lobules, but um, the, the arterioles are very small. Um, and you can see the airway is much bigger than the artery there. Um, this patient had um, P the PIZZ variant, the allele variant, which is the most severe. Um, and then um, there's a lot of uh, dendriform uh, ossification, which I don't know if, if you guys have seen it. I don't, I don't know if there's any association or if this is just a coincidence. Or is that something else that I'm mistaking? I've not seen that with alpha-1 ever. I, neither have I. That's, I mean, to me, what's interesting here is we see alpha-1 all the time. I've never seen it yeah. with much dendriform ossification. Yeah. Is that is that what would you guys agree that that's what that is? That's what I thought, but I yeah no, it's yeah. definitely dendriform. Yeah, location looks like a lot more than I normally for dendriform. I don't see this much usually. Yeah. Peter, how much? How old is this person? Uh, I don't re I don't recall uh, to be honest. I think they're they're in their sixties or seventies, I think, but I don't remember the. So one one consideration for DPO otherwise unexplained is amyloidosis. Okay. So, uh, you know, and that age is not bad. So maybe it's DPO related to amyloid. Okay. Okay. It's really interesting. You'd call it, you might call it interstitial amyloid in that setting, but. Be and, then that would be, and then that would have, that would just be not related to the alpha one also. Well, it might just be, it might be the sort of chronic yeah. disease. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. okay. Yes. One thing to keep in mind, I don't think it's it's the case here, but if you have a lot of pulmonary amyloidosis, you can get, a, and David has shown us cases of this, um, you can get an acquired form of emphysema in patients with severe pulmonary amyloidosis. Um, you won't have the alpha one antitrypsin deficiency, and usually I would see the usually the the amyloidosis is usually much more florid. The opacities of it, and the areas of emphysema are intimately associated with the opacities of amyloidosis of lung. Okay. I, I think this person is entitled to have two diseases. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. This one, uh, this one was shown to be by one of my colleagues. Um, this is I'll show the axial first. Thing. This is another patient with uh, scleroderma and crust um, syndrome, and then the uh, the abnormality here is the esophagus, and the finding is easier to. So she's had, uh, she's, she has scleroderma, so she has esophageal dysmotility and she's gotten uh, her esophagus dilated. It's had a hundred times. Um, it's clearly, a, clearly abnormal, but this is the abnormality and it looks like a, you see it better on the uh, coronal and sagittals, but it's this strange looking mid esophageal ring type of structure there. So we had never seen that before, and I didn't know of any of these. I didn't know of rings at that le at that location, and especially associated with scleroderma. Have you guys seen anything like that? Just what are you showing us on the pool? This, this right there. This is it. Um, 
kind of web or ring in the mid esophagus. Well, you said she had a bunch of dilation, so you wonder if it's just. You think it's from uh, dilations? Yeah, maybe like, like okay. some mild muscle tears that eventually he's kind of scarred down. Yeah, because usually the whole esophagus is just one patchless tube. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never seen yeah, that. I've seen that behaved on a on an esophagram if it's fixed or. Yes. Yeah, I didn't have an esophagram though. No, well, that's, that's no, I've not seen that. Um, so. Okay. That's all I had. All right. Thank you. All right. I think we've got everybody. Okay. Well, I can show some now. Okay. Let's do the screen here. Okay. So let's start with some fun. Oh shoot, the PA didn't come over. Um, let's skip that one. Um. So here's something we've we've talked a lot about lately. This is a patient who um, had a uh, stem cell transplant for AML, allogeneic, and was neutropenic. And I'll get the dates on this. And uh, became neutropenic and developed a fever. And so this was one of the radiographs. And you can see there is a very subtle abnormality here on the left lung. And eventually um, worried about infection. So it was on the usual suspect of um, range of, of antibiotics and stuff, but was not responding. And so we see this nodule here, and then there's this one here in the left upper lobe that I'll bring your attention to. And you'll see that, yeah, let me just move the go-to meeting out of the way. Doesn't want to move, but you can see it's kind of got a denser rim and sort of a dirty looking interior. And then there's another little one here in the anterior upper lobe. And then we're gonna have one down in the lower lobe as well, right there. And this one, is a much more denser rim here. So like a, a dirty looking reversed halo, but almost bird's nesty, this one, as well as that one in the left upper lobe. And yeah. so we suggested this was invasive fungus and even mentioned mucor by name. And um, this is the scan that was done about uh, 12 days later. And you can see that Larry has gotten bigger. And then if we scroll up, we'll see that this one is really kind of exploded here in the left upper lobe. Move this out of the way. There we go. So this is a really nice example of a bird's nest with a dense outer rim and sort of the dirty looking center. So it's I I I think I want to say the bird's nest is sort of a variant of the reversed halo, but we've seen a lot of cases of it, and it frequently turns out to be mucor. So they um, they couldn't culture it any other way, so they actually did a biopsy of this, and and it grew out mucor. So this is mucor mycosis. Uh, with some multiple bird's nests. So this one isn't treatable by surgery. Sometimes they'll resect these, but um, by a different round of antifungal therapy. So I had a follow-up scan not too long ago that shows this is slowly getting better. What happens is it typically will cavitate out and then eventually collapse down. Okay, this was kind of a fun case. So this was a lung cancer screen and an active smoker. And... Um, has a bunch of little nodules, and I don't think the diagnosis is going to be tricky for anyone, but you can see already there's a little tiny Cheerio up here in the left apex. And then just a bunch of really small, dirty looking nodules mm -hmm. and some mild emphysema. And then, for example, this nodule here has a little hole in it. This one is trying to have a little hole. And um, upper zone predominant fizzles out as you go to the bases. So, I mean, I think pretty classic for longer hunt cell histiocytosis in an active smoker who's presumably asymptomatic. Now, lung rads doesn't have a provision for this. Um, I, I did not even consider reporting every nodule. So I called it a 2S modifier for longer hunt cell histiocytosis. I, this is, I'm surprised we haven't seen more of this. This is, I think, the first one I've seen on a lung cancer screen. That's a good point. I, I, I don't see them. Maybe it's because our lung cancer screening population is older. Yeah. And it's seen in younger patients, but I don't know why it's seen in younger patients versus yeah, older patients. I don't patients. know either. I also think. Um, I'm sorry. Jeff, did you say how old this person is? Uh, they were on the younger end of the screening population, so I want to say in their 50s.
But yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's a disease we don't see. We, we see, not, not we see it several times a year just as an incidental finding. But I mean, we don't do a ton of screens around here. But um, I'm just surprised more people haven't talked about it. All right. Now, as pro oh, I'll show this one real quickly, and then I'll show the ones I mentioned last week. So this was just a cute little case. I don't even remember why it was done. Uh, patient has a trait, but it's it's just a fun anatomic variant. And we've seen some variation, but the patient has this little diverticulum coming off the uh, proximal descending aorta, which seems to be a trunk that gives rise to the bronchial arteries. But it also gives rise to this anomalous vessel here, which if we follow up, crosses the mediastinum, whoops, lost it there, um, crosses over, becomes this vessel here, and is the right vertebral artery. So this is an aberrant right vert, but and I've, we've seen cases before, and I, um, I even have a case where both verts come off the aorta, but this is the first time I've seen one come off the bronchial artery trunk, or whatever you want to call this little diverticulum right here. Oh. I'm taking it. No one's ever seen that before. I guess it's <laughs> silence. That goes and becomes a vertebral. Yeah. It's kind of cute. Okay. As promised, um, this these are two patients, and some of you have seen these before, who uh, were seen in our pulmonary hypertension clinic. Uh, this patient um is, they're both in their 20s they both have inflammatory bowel disease uh i gotta remember which one this is i believe this is the one that has um ulcerative colitis anyway um had this very abnormal let me get the right one here let me scan here yes this is it here so it has this um on this skin, you see there's some big bronchial arteries, but this right pulmonary artery is not normal. It's narrowed, it's thickened, and it's concentric. There's no eccentric filling defect. But the other finding, and this was referred to our clinic for chronic PE, which I don't think this is at all. Um, and the other abnormality is this right axillary and subclavian artery is narrowed and very, very thin here. So uh, when I was asked about this case, I, I know I share it with a couple of you, but one of my thoughts is this is not chronic PE at all, but rather a large vessel vasculitis. And given her age, she's under 30, probably going to be a takayasu. There's no aortitis, but given that systemic artery, and it turns out on physical exam, she didn't even have a pulse on that, on that side there. So uh, I think a good fit. Her inflammatory markers were mildly elevated. So we've seen cases of Takayasu is involving pulmonary arteries, but I don't recall seeing a case where we didn't see our aortitis coexistent. Now, Peter showed a case last week. I think it was Peter showed a case, um, of, or maybe it was Brian. I can't remember, but someone, we had a case last week of very similar. But interesting, so this patient had inflammatory bowel disease and, and um, is being treated with steroids. Meanwhile, there was another patient that had been seen in the same clinic, roughly the same age. I think this one's 25 and has also has inflammatory bowel disease, and for years has been called fibrosing mediastinitis. Um, and I can show you why. Um, you can see this very small left pulmonary artery um, going down there, and she even had a stent put in in this anterior right upper lobe or apical segment here, but it's already thrombosed. But what bothers me for a fibrosing mediastinitis, and this has been going on for a long time, diagnosis, is the fact that only the arteries are involved. There's nice juicy bronchial artery collaterals that are not obstructed there's no lymphatic or venous obstruction you can see there's no septal line she's had a little bitty infarcts um so i think this also might be a large vessel vasculitis probably the same one um, and there is a link between inflammatory bowel disease and large vessel vasculitis i don't know how strong it is but there are some publications that talk about it this patient's been on rituximab though and has not responded and also, it's bilateral without a discrete mass. So I, would you guys agree with me that this probably is a large vessel vasculitis um, because it just doesn't yeah. fit for fibrosis? Yeah, it's not fibrosis or mediastinitis. Yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be bilateral. I mean, exactly. Without a, and there's no mass or yeah. even infiltrating soft tissue. 
And if you put the earliest one with this one side by side, I think the origin, if I remember correctly, of the right middle lobe saddle was also narrowing a bit over time. This is 2016. Yeah, if we go back even there, you can see how narrow this was. The right middle lobe was also, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure if I sent you guys this one or not, but I think the one you did, Howard, the, uh, this was this one here. Yeah, there's, uh, I think this is the most recent. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. But I didn't know about the potential, the case reports that right. I think you sent out. It's unclear. Or but it makes sense in that both autoimmune diseases. Inflammatory bowel disease and but my experience with fibrosis mucinitis is the vein is usually the first thing to go because it's the lowest pressure and then along with the lymphatics and the airways and arteries go much later. Yeah, and especially because the left superior pulmonary vein is coursing right through that ball of inflammation and right. isn't even involved. Right. And just yeah. the vein sense, it's not even mildly narrowed going through yeah. that same area. And the PA, which is a higher pressure structure, is... Yeah. Yeah, right. I don't think it's... Yeah, so I think these are both Takayasu or some sort of large vessel vasculitis. Okay. Sure. Um, this is this is kind of funny. So this goes... This is sort of a companion case to Howard's case. So this patient... Um, I'll show the newer scan first, but you can see has a laryngeal... This is a Larry tube, but has, has had a trachea... A permanent... Um, has a laryngectomy with a permanent tracheostomy for squamous cell cancer of the larynx has gotten some radiation and had um, a bunch of lung nodules. I don't see this, but um, this was the follow-up scan. And what we see are all these little cystic spaces. There's one there. Wait, it's going to get bigger on my screen. Make it a little bigger here. Here we go. Um, at the side of all the, and I'll show you the nodules in advance, but they're these nice thin walled cysts. And if you didn't have any history and you didn't have the old scan, you might think this is a cystic lung disease. Kind of looks like maybe, I don't know, there's not a ton of them, but sort of LIP looking cysts. They're perivascular, thin walled, sort of basal predominant. But uh, just a couple months ago, these were all nodules and cavitary oh, nodules. We have two cases that just like the other yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, so this is a squamous cell, and this patient got this just the usual um, cytotoxic chemotherapy, but um, I, yeah, I mean, some were cavitary, but now they're just, they've just become cysts. Right. So guys, I've seen this, I've seen this with bladder cancer with treatment. So, you know, I think what happens is you, um, squamous cells in particular like to, they produce keratin. The keratin liquefies and can be uh, coughed out and that can leave you with a cyst. Um, and then I think if you just kill the tumor with chemotherapy too, uh, the tumor necrosis, and you're left with a thin-walled cyst. So you know, I've seen this, you know, with a number of metastases, but bladder is the most consistent one. Yeah, like this one here. Yeah, the, I, I guess that. And those are usually transitional cells, though. Yeah, but the transitional cells are actually squamous. That's true. That's true. Yeah, so that was kind of interesting that you had that case, Howard. So speaking yeah, of bladder cancer, David, you'll like, you yeah. all like this case. Um, so this patient, um, let's see the dates right here. So he has a history of, of superficial bladder cancer and was treated, uh, with BCG, um, in the, um, intravescular BCG for multiple superficial bladder cancers, uh, back, I want to say almost like six or seven months ago and eventually became sick and presented with a radiograph that looks like this. And you can, and I say sick, he had fever, cough, and altered mental status. And you can see he's got some left lower lobe consolidation, maybe an effusion, but he's got very grainy looking lungs. Makes you wonder if there's a bunch of tiny nodules. So a CT scan done, uh, and I made the times off a little bit, but let me make this bigger so you can all see it. There we go. If you look very carefully, and I'm, I'll have to do some MIPS, there's a very subtle nodular texture to the lungs. Hmm. A lot of motion there. Make sure I have the right images here. I hear the nips. 
can seem a little bit better. Just a bunch of little tiny nodules, not as nice as I'd like to see them. Did I kind of grab the wrong series? But, um, but also, as I said, I was having some brain issues. And where are the coronal posts? Yeah, here we go. And you can see here, there's all these little punctate enhancing foci in the brain as well. And then along the meninges. So this is um, disseminated in bovis, which is the um, organism they use um, for this intravesicular treatment of TCCs. And we've seen cases before, but this is the first one I've ever seen that had CNS involvement. Wow. Let's see if I show them on these MIPS again. They're really hard to see. I think I have the right CT date. Yeah, that's, I don't know why you're not seeing them very well, but yeah. I'll see if I, I'll dig around, make sure I got the right scan. Um, but um, no, you can see it. You can see them in the yeah. upper. I mean, the, the diffuse fine. Yeah, you know, they're just really solid. I mean, they're, they're clear as day on the radiograph. There's something wrong with the lungs. Yeah, I still haven't seen a case since my fellowship. It's the last time I saw a case. Yeah, I haven't seen one in a long time, but this is the first time I've seen one. We've seen lung involvement, but I've never seen one. And it's rather delayed, yeah. too. That's the other thing as well. But they were covered in, bo in bogus. So, all right. Um, and then this case is kind of interesting. This is a, a little iatrogenic special. So this patient carries a diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis presented with uh, some dysphagia and feeling of stuck food. So had an endoscopy, um, and it sounds like at the time they, uh, in the lower esophagus, they had a small perf, which they then clipped with some of their endosco endoscopic clips. So they sent the patient to CT. Unfortunately, there was no radiograph, it'd be nice, but you can see no, no problem here. There's pneumomediastinum. But what's kind of cool is you get gas tracking in the different layers of the esophageal wall. So like a a new a sort of an esophageal dissection and then what, what's even cooler is if we go down further you can see there's a ton of portal venous gas and you wonder how it gets there well it does track back into the esophagastric uh, wall so if we go down to the there are the clips to the esophagastric junction you can see the gas tracking here into the stomach wall so this is a benign portal venous gas they did an esophagram i i downloaded it but it doesn't show anything i can show the cine loop just showing there's no leak at the time, but he's clearly got some motility issues. Um, yeah, I'll just run the series real quickly. It drains pretty well, but there's no no leak. And then right there, you can see sort of a sluggish drainage. And these are the two clips. So it was a small iatrogenic perf, enough gas escaped at the time, dissected along the wall, the esophagus, and into the mediastinum. But, um, so they're just treating him with IV antibiotics for a couple of days, and that's about it. That's kind of a, I wish I had a radiograph for that one. Well, this um, last case I wanted to show, I don't, somehow I don't have the PA image, but um, we can, we can make one or something. Uh, this was a young guy who's from northeastern, northwestern Wisconsin, presented with cough and fever, uh, not responding to antibiotics. And you can see he's got this ugly multifocal consolidation and small nodules, a trace effusion, um, and a little bit of cavitation. So um, he had a radiograph, which, as I said, only had the lateral. But uh, we suggest the diagnosis of um, blastomycosis. Uh, given the history of not responding, he was from northern Wisconsin. Because uh, typically someone on augmentin or something of that effect should have some response. And the fact that it was multifocal. And we asked them not to do the CT because it wasn't going to change anything. So they waited a few days and then did the CT. And doesn't change anything. But uh, th this grew out on the fungal smear of blasto, the budding yeast. So I haven't seen a case. It's been a couple months, but it, it, it's. I always think about it when I see a ugly looking infection uh, that doesn't respond. The, the main differential would be tuberculosis for a patient with scan like this. But I, I always harp on the fact that the effusions when present are very small. And there's really not much in the way of lymphadenopathy in the majority of cases, some mild reactive nodes, but not the ugly necrotic looking nodes you see with TB or the large, um, really big nodes you can see with histoplasmosis and then this tiny effusion. So blastomycosis, there's the 
lateral just showing you that that appearance i can try to do a race and uh, i can't do it all right okay well those are my cases um i think i showed everything that looks like it okay jeff i have one more if you have time yeah for sure show pretty quick Um, so this patient uh, is a middle-aged um, female. Uh, she has a history of multiple um, uh, overdoses she's been admitted for, and uh, uh, she was found down by her family uh, with enc encephalopathy, and uh, she had um, uh, she was found to have there was a lot of empty alcohol bottles were found next to her, so resumed alcohol intoxication. Um, this is her prior CT, and um, this is her, the CT that she came, so this prior one was from um, December of 2019, pretty normal. And this is the CT she came in with um, a few days ago. So um, she had a negative uh, COVID test, and uh, she also has a, she carries a diagnosis of sweet syndrome, which um, I was not at all familiar with, but uh, it's also um, uh, called, the disease is called, the, uh, goes by the name uh, acute febrile uh, neutrophilic dermatosis. Um, so it's primarily a dermatologic condition where you get red, uh, red lesions, papules, something similar to erythema multiforme um, and uh, we we weren't sure I mean this basically looks like a, an acute interstitial or acute lung injury um, we didn't really have a otherwise we didn't have a good so we just kind of thought this could be an, an AIP type of acute lung injury um, but we also what we're, we're wondering if um, it could be related to sweet syndrome and we found a few case reports where you you get this acute um, acute uh, infiltrate in, in the lungs, this neutrophilic uh, exudate. Can you go back to the lower lobes? I mean, I mean, it has a lot of that peribronchovascular sparing. I don't know if I'm overcalling, but uh, does she vape at all? I mean, she's a drug addict. Yeah, I didn't see. I was wondering the same thing, and I, I didn't see uh, history of that. I would find, is she still in house, or is she gone? Uh, she got she um, she got discharged and uh, she uh, she also refused uh, steroids, which is the the, the uh, treatment for this. But, uh, does, she, does she shoot up? Is that part of her um, drug abuse? Shoot up? No, I don't. I don't. I didn't see that specifically. But I yeah, I, I'm not sure about that. But yeah, it looks yeah, very much looks like it could be. Also vaping. So. Yeah, I mean, it's some. I mean, it's some acute lung injury. It doesn't, you know, yeah. not really specific. But I, I, I mean, it it would fit perfectly for, you know, a hundred of the hundred and sixty cases we kind of see. Yeah. It's just a perfect yeah. kind of I'll, uh, I'll ask her. I'll ask the. Uh, so she, I think she was just seen. I'm not sure if she was seen by pulmonology or she was just managed in the DR. Her uh, respiratory status was just good enough to where she didn't need to get. Um, uh, you know, it it yeah. looks like a it looks like an airway. Um, you know, approach to the lungs here. It's being yeah. concentrated in the upper lobes like this. And if she was using crack or something like that too, it could be something inhaled. Yeah. So have you guys uh, seen sweet syndrome? Yes. I've um, heard of not seeing it involved in lungs. Okay. Yeah, well, well, I have, but a lot of those cases, you know, that, that were thought to be sweet syndrome, sometimes they're actually from injected uh, feces and things like that. So people who are in you know they create this this disseminated infection that goes to their skin but also can go to their lungs if they're injecting uh, uh -huh. in, intentionally injecting something infectious so um yeah it can cause diffuse lung disease the couple of cases i've seen yeah yeah we saw we, we saw a few case reports um but it says relatively rare uh, right. but this looks like this more like this looks more like something inhaled than injected 
Uh huh. Okay. I agree. It, it looks to me, it looks like a, uh, yeah, it's definitely possible to be an inhalational thing. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. All up. Thanks. Thanks, right. everyone. Talk to you next week. Great. Thanks, everyone.